So let's continue on our discussion of nuclear chemistry with the last lecture. And last time we reviewed nuclear fission. So let's go back to go forward. And nuclear fission is an example of this artificial transmutation. Remember transmutation, we're talking about an unstable nucleus becoming something else more stable, except in this uh, way, what we have is a very large overcrowded nucleus that gets stable not by emitting an alpha particle, but by being split into a uh, smaller nucleus that's not overcrowded. Okay, so splitting of the atom. It's important to realize that there are only four fissionable isotopes. So this isn't something that all atoms that are overcrowded can do. And we need a special circumstance. So nuclear fission, also called atomic energy. Uh, you can't make an atomic bomb. The first bombs dropped or made were, were fission bombs. They have to be made by a particular way, by a slow-moving neutron. Now, neutrons uh, make this nucleus unstable, and then it splits, and it does so uh, partly because it doesn't have a charge. Okay. Any case, uh, the key here is that we have two reactants or reacting nuclei that have to hit each other. This is not a natural phenomenon, although it can occur in nature, I guess, in some aspect, but we call this artificial transmutation an example, but we call it fission because it's splitting the atom. And notice something, it makes three more neutrons, and the key here, it gives off tremendous amount of energy that we're going to talk about today, uh, much a thousand times more than uh, we see in chemical reactions. Okay. Now, the key here with these uh, fission is that you can have a uncle controllable chain reaction or just a chain reaction in general. Here are the four known fissionable isotopes uh, that can do this and, and these are what we call our nuclear fuels in nuclear reactors and of course these are our weapons grade type of um, fissional material that we can make bombs from okay nuclear devices but the key here is that a small moving neutron splits it into a very stable fragment okay and then three more neutrons but i will say that these fragments aren't always um completely stable which means that they themselves can be undergoing beta radiation okay so it's key to know that in these types of fissionable uh, types of reactions, we may be getting products that they themselves have some half-lives with some kind of dangerous um, type of emission, like a beta particle. But the key here is that we produce more neutrons, right? So we split one neut one um, fissional material, in this case we have uranium-235, and we make three more neutrons that can find more, okay? And so it's important to realize that this could be an un well, a chain reaction that could be a bomb, which is an un controllable reaction or it could be controlled if we absorb some of these neutrons and slow this down and that's what we do in nuclear reactors we control that reaction so it's important but the energy that we're getting here is a thousand times more than a chemical process so we don't need as much fuel all right and here are some examples okay and there are more examples I'm just showing you the examples in uranium 235 okay notice we're producing more neutrons at the end and then we have these smaller fragments these fragments are more stable although not completely stable some of these themselves are radioactive so when we have a nuclear reactor that undergoes fission we have those um, fuel rods that have those uranium pellets or plutonium pellets or whatever fission material you have okay they will undergo fission but they themselves would produce products that could be radioactive. Um, I know strontium-90 is a beta emitter. Okay, so this guy itself has half-lives that are pretty long. And not all of the uranium will fission, so you have uranium itself in that goopy mixture that we have to remove after a while and store on site as waste. Okay, so any case, uh, we've been through all of this before, okay, and we've seen how nuclear power plants uh, exist in our area and there's plenty of them and they're getting older okay we're not building new ones okay so the earliest the newest one in our area I think is 1991 if I'm not mistaken okay 1990 the Seabrook one all right but any case um, we've been through these we've talked about the disasters or the, or the complete meltdowns and partial meltdowns of the reactor core when there was an issue where the reaction got 
a little bit out of control and produce so much heat that it melted down the lead steel reinforced uh, containment uh, for the reactors okay so it's important you realize all those things and we talked about the advantages and disadvantages here and of course the advantages one more time is that we're not emitting a greenhouse gas by co2 we're not emitting also other components that come from coal or gasoline or fossil fuels like sulfur or no2s that can produce acid rains we produce a large amount of energy but a small amount of fuel a fistful of uranium can run the city or the manhattan for a day or two think about that a fistful of uranium okay of course decreased dependence on fossil fuels disadvantage is that this radioactive waste with tremendous amount of half-lives of unreacted unfissioned i should say um, um uranium and the byproducts of the, the fissional products themselves have uh long half-lives uh, that we have to store on site okay we'd have no place to to put them and of course there's that huge potential for a meltdown or release of radiation into the environment from the reactor core as we talked about so now we're going to go on to um the other type of a nuclear reaction uh, of course we're always talking about the nucleus and this is nuclear fusion and this is the one that uh, really has a lot of interest okay internationally all right and this of course is the reaction that our own sun or the stars in our universe undergo and essentially what it is is very light nuclei come together to make a little bit heavier one uh, maybe a, a neutron in this case and then energy. Notice this is tritium, this is deuterium, these are what isotopes of hydrogen. They come together to make helium. Now helium itself is not radioactive. It may give off a neutron. Um, and then of course we have the energy. So I don't know why it's going forward on me. But in any case, the point I'm trying to make here is that the energy given off in nuclear fusion is about three to four times greater than fission. So that's a good thing. So even a smaller amount of fuel can actually run New York City or Manhattan. Um, we don't make any radioactive byproducts, so there's no waste to worry about. And the most important thing, you know, uranium and nuclear fission, we have to dig in the ground and then we have to enrich it because if we remember it, only uranium-235 and 233 are fissionable. Uranium-238, which is 99.9% .9 of all uranium, is not fissionable. So that's important. Here, the fuel in nuclear fusion is just hydrogen. And there's hydrogen all over the place. Hydrogen is the number one most abundant element in the universe. So we have a heck of a lot more of it than we do uranium. And it gives us a heck of a lot more energy. And of course, it gives us byproducts which in itself are not radioactive they're clean so fission or nuclear fusion is something we want to move toward now there are some issues with that but a case the bottom line is light nuclei coming together to make a little bit heavier one with tremendous amount of energy again this is what the stars use okay it's a clean source okay now here are some examples okay and i again as i gave you examples of of fission splitting a big overcrowded unstable nucleus here what we have is is light nuclei coming together okay notice sometimes I'll make two hydrogens helium and the bottom line this is a uh, a mega electron volt it's just a, a value of energy we've been using joules so this is another uh, way to describe energy and it's very very exothermic okay bottom line is light nuclei combining into heavier nuclei releasing about three or five three to four times more energy than nuclear fission and that of course on top of the fact that you have a lot a huge amount of hydrogen in the um, a lot more fuel available to us in the universe for as opposed to uranium and we get more energy and we don't create any half-lives of any nasty chemicals or radioactive waste so something we would love to move toward okay but there is issues okay and the issue of course okay is that it's not economically viable we haven't figured out how to do this commercially we've done this in small tests in labs and the problem is when you take two nitro take um light nuclei or even let's go back to an equation when we try to put these two atoms together to fuse them it's a way to remember this 
Remember, a proton on a proton doesn't is going to repel itself electrostatically. So because of that repulsion force, we need tremendous amount of energy to push these guys together. So as I speak, people are trying to figure out that problem. But right now, we can create this reaction. But overall, okay, it takes more energy to push these guys together than the energy given out right now. So we haven't figured out. And so the movies that have come out in the 90s or the 2000s, cold fusion is a word you hear. Cold fusion just means that we found a way to lower the activation cold to start the reaction. Another word for this type of reaction is called thermonuclear. Thermo. Thermonuclear means thermo means you need tremendous energy to push these atoms together. So that's the problem with nuclear fusion. Now what's interesting enough is that well how does the star do it? How do how, may, and if you believe in the fact that maybe we're being watched by aliens and or there's other life forms that are intelligent, more intelligence and how they're traveling um, to our planet, okay, maybe they have learned how to use this if that's a possibility. The bottom line is somehow they have somewhat, somehow, some way, okay, how does the star, I should say, somehow, some way, maybe another technology has figured this out, we're working on this, but the star naturally has, a, has an ability to do this. So the sun, our sun, can do this reaction. By the way, we discovered helium on the sun before we discovered it on the planet using the what? The emission um, the emission light or the light emitting from helium and, 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 and detecting those wavelengths. Okay, the bright line spectra I meant to say. But the bottom line here is um, the problem putting this together, you need to know, is that you need a lot of energy. So how does the sun do it? Well, the sun does it because the sun has tremendous amount of gravity. And the gravity can hold this fuel in place. And then, of course, on top of that, the temperature in the sun is tremendously high. So with a huge amount of gravity holding these guys down, and then with high tremendous temperatures, you can force these guys together. Okay? And that, of course, is how the sun does it. But we haven't figured out how to do it on Earth viably yet. So that is something you need to understand. So any case... Um, the advantage is an unlimited source of fuel, hydrogen and water, clean power, no pollutants or radioactive weights, more energy produced in fission, and obviously thousands of times greater than energy produced in chemical reactions. Disadvantages, not economically viable. I haven't figured out how to do this. It takes more energy to start a fusion reaction than given off. Thermonuclear describes fusion reaction because all the heat needed you to start the reaction. So, any something to be aware of. Okay, all right. So, when we talk about the reasoning why fission and fusion give off so much energy, we need to talk something about the binding energy. Okay, now binding energy, and this is a very famous graph, and I love this graph and love talking about this, but this is showing us the binding energy per nucleon. Nucleon essentially just means a proton and a neutron. Okay, so let me explain this. Obviously, here's the mass number. So smaller atoms have lower binding energy. Well, okay, what's the binding energy? Well, the binding energy is the force that keeps the nucleus together. And there's two forces at play here. In the atom, okay, we have the strong force. Now, the strong force essentially is the strongest force in nature, and it keeps the, um, the quarks together. Essentially, it keeps the protons and neutrons together as well. Now, the other force, now it's important to realize that the strong force in nature, which is really keeping quarks together that make the protons and neutrons, and th therefore keeping them together in the nucleus, it's important to realize that the strong force only works over a very small, small distance. Okay? And so the electrostatic force, this is the force you've been talking about all year in chemistry, protons positive attracting electrons negative, the positive and negative attractive forces we've been talking all year, Coulomb's law, electrostatic force is a weaker force, okay? And, and although it's weaker, it works over a greater distance. So as we see in physics, as forces weaken, they work over a longer distance. Believe it or not, gravity is weaker than those other two forces. Okay, so gravity is weaker than electrostatic force, and gravity is weaker than the strong force, yet gravity can work over longer distances, over galaxies, right? Okay, we're affected by the sun's gravitational pull, and we're so far away from it. So gravity being a weaker force, even though it can be significant, obviously goes can work over a longer distance. So the point I'm trying to make is there's two forces at play. Now, 
the point here is, is that when atoms get overcrowded and when the mass number gets bigger, their binding energy drops. Now, why does the binding energy drop? Well, because the atom is getting so big that the repulsive forces, the electrostatic forces, okay, are repelling the, the protons away from the protons. And so these atoms are unstable. So think of the binding energy as a measure of stability, okay? So the greater the binding energy, the greater the force holding together the nucleus, the more stable that atom can be. And the atoms that don't have large binding energy are a little bit or are unstable, which means they don't have they're, ha they're having these repulsive forces. Remember, uh, as you add too many what protons to the nucleus, it gets overcrowded, and we learned about emitting an alpha particle to get stable, right? M losing two protons and two neutrons to try to lower that cr overcrowding. Well, the reason why it's overcrowded is because as you add more protons, the nucleus gets bigger. And as it gets bigger, the strong force that keeps protons and neutrons can't work over those long distances and then therefore the repulsive electrostatic forces start becoming a little bit greater than the strong force and it becomes easier to pull these guys apart so their binding energy the energy holding them together is lowered which means they are ripe to be split right to be broken off and to be fissioned and this is, this is where uranium is here now over here you have low binding energy because there's not a lot of what protons here right hydrogen one okay only has one proton so essentially has no binding energy you need to have another nucleon so deuterium okay hydrogen two has a little bit more uh, binding energy okay so these guys because they're smaller nuclei and the strong force can easily work over the smaller distance of that nucleus having less stuff in it okay it dominates and it gets more stable as you add more protons because you're increasing the positive pulling force or the positive strong force in that area until it kind of peaks at about iron okay so let's go on to the next one and we're going to go back to that, but we need to talk about something called mass defects and binding energy here. Now, I've talked about the energy that is needed to hold a nucleus together, but it also can be talked about is the energy supplied to break the nucleus. Okay, so it's, it's remember, it's an endo-exothermic thing. All right, but the bottom line is it re represents the energy keeping the protons and neutrons together. Now, this very famous equation e equals mc squared okay came from the special rel relativity um paper of 1905 um by albert einstein he proposed three things in 1905 and of course it was the photoelectric effect that won the nobel prize the other one was uh, the Brownian motion that discovered atoms a big deal of course in 1905 and then of course his work with special theory of relativity where he said matter and energy are interrelated okay uh, notice it goes through the speed of light squared now I want to talk about this because um, it was in nuclear equations that we first were able to see what Einstein was able to come up with meaning his work in that area of special relativity was verified by the energy changes and the mass changes okay in that when we talked about in the previous lecture that mass changes that's called mass defect the defect of mass the loss of mass in, in, in nuclear equations see in chemical equations we're always talking about the um, conservation of mass and even though we do so uh, in uh, nuclear equations we know there's a tiny bit of mass missing so the energy that's released okay in nuclear reactions artificial and natural is equal to the missing little bit of mass that's related to the binding energy believe it or not because energy and matter are equivalent or are interrelated or connected times the speed of light squared so a little bit of mass gets missing in these types of reactions but when you multiply it by a huge number the velocity of light the speed of light and square that a huge number you get a very significant amount of energy okay and of course this energy difference is dealing with the differences in the energy keeping the atom together okay and just keep that close as we go through this okay so here's an example of deuterium and tritium coming together and fusing remember they need some energy to, to, to overcome the repulsive forces and they make they fuse into helium and one neutron when we mass out this is called the atomic mass unit okay we give the atomic mass unit it's 
Um, basically, it's related to uh, obviously gram, but grams are going to be so small. We use these as a relative scale to each other, but they're still um, uh, they're still uh, can be massed out uh, into grams or kilograms if you want to. But these are uh, a relative scale to each other. But bottom line is, when we take the mass of the two reactants and take the mass of the two uh, products here. We get a mass before and after, and the after mass, okay, the ab, the mass, the mass going on in the, in the after or in the product side, is much much greater. I'm sorry, is a, a little bit smaller, I should say, not much smaller, just a little bit smaller, and so that's the missing mass and that's the mass defect. Okay, now what I did here is take, okay, here is the missing mass in this what we call atomic mass unit. Now there are five nucleons. Nucleons are protons or neutrons and these are the things held together by the strong force, right? The binding energy. Now when we're going to find the uh, the mass loss per nucleon, I divide by five and I see there's 0.00037763. And then this is a fraction of a mass of a neutron or a proton. So this is a tiny fraction as you can see. All right, but this tells us how much mass per nucleon was lost. And, and where did it go? Well, it's the energy that was released. Okay, or it was the energy uh, that was partly keeping these guys together. I don't care how you think about it, but essentially this missing mass represents the energy that's lost. And if, if energy is lost, that would mean that the helium is now more stable, which means it's got a greater binding energy. Its nucleus is held tighter than these two individually. Okay, but let's keep this number, okay, 0 0.0037. Let's look at now nuclear fission. Now we know that nuclear fission is splitting the atom. Okay, so heavy nucleus, uranium-233, we get our fragments, three more neutrons. And we do, we find out the um, atomic mass units, do the math to figure out. We see that there's 0.18 atomic mass units missing. The other one had units, this is atomic mass units, it's the same thing. So the other one was, was uh, not as great, right? If you look at the other one, it was uh, missing um, 0 0.018884 okay missing and looked at fission the raw number is 0.18 so all oh, more mass missing but when you divide it by how many nucleons were involved right 235 plus one protons and neutrons combined you get 0 0.000076 okay units per nucleons mass lost meaning there's less mass lost per nucleon in this reaction and what's so important about that well what's important about that oops is that because there is more mass missing in nuclear fusion per particle, hey, Christmas, I don't know what's happening, okay? But because there's more mass missing, okay, I can do this. All right, we're going to go forward again. Because there's more mass missing, okay, in nuclear fusion, all right, the two light nuclei coming together, there's going to be more energy released, that's important. Make this mass bigger than the mass lost in nuclear fission splitting the atom times it by a huge number squared, you get more energy. Okay, it's important that you understand that nuclear fusion has a greater mass defect, which leads to a greater energy being released. And that's the reason why we want to go to it, because it gives us more energy. Also, if we have tremendous amount of fuel and of course we don't have any radioactive waste that's something we need to be working on it and it's 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 amazing to me that we haven't as a nation or a international statement say we're going to work on this you know and and uh, there's not a lot of government funding that actually works on this it makes you think about what runs our country that you know but uh, we're hopefully going to get there all right so any case uh, that bring back this this curve again here to make more sense. This is remember binding energy. And a way to look at binding energy is to look at the more look at the value of stability. If you have more of a strong force or an energy keeping your atom together, it takes more energy to split them. So iron 56 is one of the most stable atoms. Its nucleus is held together. And why? Well. It has a great balance of a lot of protons, a lot of strong force, and the fact why that nucleus is still small enough to minimize the electrostatic repulsion. Remember, we have attractive force, the strong force that keeps nucleons together, and then we have the repulsive force, okay? The strong force works over a small distance, the electrostatic force becomes more dominant over big distances. So, as the distance of the atom gets bigger, as you add more nucleons, protons, and neutrons, 
the 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 atom's nuclei nucleus gets bigger and therefore electro electrostatic repulsion start persisting and they destabilize the nucleus notice uranium 235 is lower in binding energy it doesn't have the energy to keep it together that's why it's susceptible for fission okay so what's cool about this is nuclear fission is we take a unstable nucleus it's overcrowded its binding energy is lower right and when it splits into its fragments which could be um, uh, barium or uh, a bunch of a different uh, xenon okay when it splits into its fragments those two fragments are going to be what little stable so when you think about uranium going up in energy difference difference between here and here is a nuclear energy when it splits into its fragments it goes let's say to xenon or let's say it goes into lead i guess they give me the two fragments here as lead okay and two more neutrons neutrons don't have any binding energy so any case so uranium splits into lead which is right here that's more stable notice it's higher higher binding energy the stronger the binding energy the more stable and then when uranium becomes xenon it jumps up here so a unstable nucleus becomes more stable the difference between here and here is the energy released now nuclear fusion hey we're starting with light nuclei and by the way these values are binding energy per nucleon so look at hydrogen it's got a zero. Why? Because there's no other nucleon to attract to, so there's no binding energy. So it makes sense that light nuclei, hydrogens, deuteriums, and tritiums, are going to have a low binding energy. And when they combine, they make helium, helium-4. And so we're going from a, a, a position, in a hydrogen, of course, but tritium and deuterium around here, we're going from 2 to 3 to like 7. There's a huge leap in energy in binding energy from these positions so these atoms are not as stable why are they not as stable they don't have as many what nucleons and strong force to keep the atom together so when you put light nuclei together to make helium there's a huge leap okay in energy per nucleon in stability and why does it get more stable because that's the energy released so here is the energy in fission from here to here. Here is the energy in fusion from here to here. Okay, now they're showing a hydrogen, but you get the idea. Okay, and that means there's more energy released in nuclear fusion. Okay, which means there's more missing mass. Okay, I think I've made my case here. Okay, uh, and here are some examples. Again, splitting the atom. And for the most part for this course, you just have to be able to, to identify, hey, slow moving nucleus is going to split this atom into its fragments two more neutrons remember there's a bunch of different ways to write that okay and then we get this energy released these guys are more stable okay and therefore that's represents the energy released okay any case moving forward all right and so now we're going to go to and finish this up talking about some of the um history behind these reactions and of course the dropping of the atomic bomb, the fission bomb, was the first ever, okay? Um, we, were, we were the first one to test and deploy, and I think the only ones to deploy a nuclear um, device uh, in wartime or on civilians, unfortunately. And if you remember the uh, history, the Enola Gay, on August 6th, 1945, dropped it, the bomb, the um, the 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 little boy on her in Hiroshima okay we'll talk about that in a second and then if you notice three days later they did it in August 9th okay we're going to talk about that now of course the history behind this was that of course we developed the bomb in the Manhattan Project as a race to build it before the Nazis did we have later found out the Nazi Germany did we're not very close to it but they certainly had the technological advancement to finally to get there at some point um, and then, of course, we continued on and tested it. And as we uh, were in, more involved in the Pacific theater after the uh, the European war, we uh, realized to defeat and stop this war, it became, although very still very controversial, we knew the only way to make Japan, to finish Japan in this war, because we've won the naval part of the battle at Midway and other different places, 
we defeated them back, okay, navally and 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 also um, on different islands moving back to Japan. The only way to get Japan to surrender was to invade Japan. And although Japan had a huge loss of life in the war and definitely didn't have as many young men anymore to defend the country through the loss of life or being defeated, they you knew that the culture of Japan was very prideful, meaning that they were not going to uh, go quietly. Anybody who had a pitchfork, rifle, gun was going to fight to the death. If you can think about the culture of Japan, about the kamikazes, the people were willing to die for their country. So uh, the Americans knew to invade Japan was going to be absolutely costly for American life. They knew they could win, okay, but they knew that it'd be absolutely costly. They'd lose so many lives as people would, you know, think about the kamikaze pilots, think about, you know, uh, every individual fighting for the death. We would eventually win, but we would lose so many lives. So the idea was to scare the Jap Japanese into thinking that we had this complete huge arsenal of these new weapons. We only had three. We tested one um, in the Trinity test. Okay, you can actually go there um, in New Mexico and visit the site now. It's safe enough. Uh, where the first one was uh, tested, and then we had two more bombs. What we what we did was, if I'm not mistaken, is that we dropped leaflets over Japan and saying, "Hey, we have this new weapon. We're going to drop on you. And please surrender." Of course, they didn't believe us, and so we uh, con uh, started to drop these bombs. And we started; we only had two of them made. But the idea was we we did it in this fashion to to make Japan think that we had just an unlimited supply of these horrible weapons. And so this is just a a pathway of the um, uh, we took off from these 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 little islands here uh, and the Nola Gay. Obviously, we couldn't take off from uh, the United States yet, but so we were here. And then, of course, the second bomb we were going to drop it on this island, this uh, city here, but it was too much cloud cover, so we went to Nagasaki. Um, but let's talk about them for a second. So the little boy, okay. Um, and this was the first bomb dropped on, and the only bomb dropped, I believe, the first, well, it's the first bomb dropped on um, in wartime or on civilians, although um, it was a gun assembly method. Um, and so in order to have an uncontrollable fission reaction, maybe these are atomic bombs, is that you have to have a... Um, a critical mass, meaning you have to have enough uranium to undergo an uncontrollable reaction. Most nuclear power plants don't have that much, even though they're, it might react uncontrollably for a little bit, uh, and you could have a burnout or a meltdown that could open up the core and expose the society to radiation, you're never going to have an explosion. So you need to have a critical mass. So this bomb contained 64 kilograms of fissionable enriched uranium. The Manhattan Project was not only building the bomb, was trying to find a way to enrich it. Now, um, it detonated 500 meters over Hiroshima on August 6. The idea of detonating this bomb over a city was that the blast would, uh, you know, kind of hit directly down on your target you didn't want the blast to be absorbed by the surrounding ground you wanted to blast you know so the idea was to explode it so they had some kind of altimeter when they dropped the bomb when it re reached a certain pressure okay it fired a uranium bullet that had some neutrons probably some beryllium there usually beryllium is usually we make some more neutrons and f shot a bullet of uranium with neutrons into a bigger okay mount that caused a controllable reaction so the estimated yield was 13 to 15 kilotons of force okay now this was an actual bomb that that was pretty devastating obviously but in today's standards it was uh, uh, very very poor in in what it did in terms of what our bombs can do now but still the type of destruction that it that it unleashed is still being felt today generations later um, I want to explain something to you. As primitive as this bomb is compared to our current arsenal, this single bomb on this single uh, device gave enough force in that explosion that equaled or bettered all of the TNT bombs that we dropped in all of World War II. So every bombing run that Britain did on Berlin and Berlin did on London and every bomb and bullet and, and, and explosion and grenade that we, we we let off in World War II, okay, all those combined did not equal the force of this bo single bomb, 
it's amazing all right but really what's interesting is that only 60 it had 64 kilograms of uranium now that's about 64 f fistful that's still a lot only 0.7 underwent nuclear fission that means they spread out 63 all right uh, 63 um, kilograms or so of uranium around like a dirty bomb remember a dirty bomb is just exploding and spreading so we spread out all this unreacted fissionable uranium that uh, actually caused more harm than the actual bomb itself let's look at the bomb for a second no, sorry, I can get there here is the little boy okay and uh, again the yield was 4.5 kilotons okay and it was a 10 foot by 6 inches bomb move this shell and we have this U-235 bullet which hits a U-235 uh, sphere remember when they combine you have critical ma mass okay and there's probably some kind of film of beryllium that exposes it to neutrons okay uh, in any case you detonate it and you get that atomic explosion all right and that mushroom cloud of just is basically is the um, impact of hitting the ground and bouncing back up all right so um, back to where we were now this bomb of course was uh, dropped on Hiroshima and uh, essentially it vaporized um, a lot of people in the half mile radius I mean total the heat that was given off here actually vaporized some people that were close to ground zero uh, and destruction was pretty darn amazing at, at, at ground zero but what destroyed the city wasn't necessarily the nuclear explosion it was the heat that was given off the heat that was given off in all directions besides the blast there's a tremendous amount of of, of wind associated here for sure and there's heat that goes in all direction that heat uh, lit a fire to the entire city and there's no way and that those fires burned out of control there was no fire department that could handle every building being on fire and it really was just uncontrollable fires that burned the city down so the pictures I'm going to show you a lot of it is from the burning of the cities some of it is from the vaporization all right uh, so let's go through this not this um, and so here is some here's the picture from the Enola Gay of the explosion on Hiroshima and here are some of the pictures at ground zero this is a very famous dome building that is now that withstand that withstood the blast if you notice uh, the, this was ground zero I think in this area here there was military there was a, there was a stadium where the military were actually doing some exercises but the rest of this is is a metropolis and so this building withstood the blast now uh, Japan lives near the ring of fire therefore there's a lot of volcanic and geological activity um, so they built some buildings definitely to withstand that but this building although it lost its roof okay um, definitely withstood that blast and heat and it's still standing today and actually now is a museum there's a couple of teachers who've been there that got pictures from me all right but here's some of the ground zero destructions here and I want to make sure that you understand the 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 the, the, the unbelievably ugliness of nuclear war even with a primitive weapon that we used then okay inside that dome building okay they have the models of what things looked like previously so this is what that building was right here and I, and I, and I don't know if it was it was some kind of government facility I, I forget off the top of my head but now it's a museum for the for the Hiroshima so these are all the buildings okay in that area and that's what it looked like after the blast so this is ground zero now this is complete vaporization from the heat some of these buildings did withstand okay uh, people in this area were vaporized okay you can actually see there's I don't think I have the picture but there's a picture of a bench where two people were sitting you can just see the carbon fiber or where they existed there so this is the uh, I believe the the ground zero zone okay you can see that's where the um, um, this is where the building we just looked at and I think uh, there's a little bridge and there's there's I think there's a place here where the um, the the military was doing exercises but mostly a um, you know a lot of a lot of um, civilians here and that's this is where they dropped the bomb here and, and that's that's that there so this is what it looked like before the bomb dropped and this this is this is the model that's actually in that dome building very interesting this is what it looked like after and this is a primitive 
weapon. And people got me these pictures. There were actually teachers in West Hampton Beach that actually went there. I would, I would love to be there one day. Okay. And so I uh, just showed you what, what, and then you can see what was left standing. I guess it may be a little off-centered here. Uh, I know, so it's kind of off to the side. This is the dome building here. Okay, so it's kind of turned on its side there. All right, so uh, crazy. And so another picture, uh, the little reconnaissance, reconnaissance photos before and after the bomb. Don't forget that um, in this area here where it's flattened out, it, it was mostly due to the um, the heat and the fires that burned the city down. Okay. Um, now, before I talk about the next one, I just want to talk about the fact that even though the bomb itself killed about 60 to 80,000 people instantaneously, hundreds of thousands of people died um, because of the fire, and even more people died because of the radiation sickness. Remember, only 0.7 kilograms fission to make this tremendous blast, which means we spread out so much radioactive material so that people were getting radioactive sickness and doctors at the time didn't know what it was. So they didn't know how to treat it. So people were just going untreated and dying because of this radioactive poisoning. People who did survive had mutagens, meaning their DNA was changed. And so second, third, fourth, fifth generation Japanese from this area uh, are still today born without um, the ability to have children, missing arms, all kind of DNA changes as have occurred. It's still going on today where people don't have the right number of limbs or have some kind of genetic dysfunction because of that mutagen, okay, that hit them way back when. Mutagen is a radioactive particle, beta or gamma, okay, um, that changed DNA when it hit them and that mutation caused them to be sick. So there was more people who died much after in a very uh, hellish way, if I can say that, okay, of their radiation poisoning and sickness than the blast itself. Okay, now we dropped a bomb on three days later on Nagasaki. Here was the idea that we were going to scare them to think that we have this unlimited supply, so we're going to keep dropping them. We were warning them. The sad part of this story was that Hiroshima went off the grid in Japan. I remember this is 1945, so we don't have internet, you don't have MSN, MBC, you don't have live updates. So Central Command headquarters of Japan, the Imperial headquarters, lost touch of Hiroshima. Uh, uh, for a day or two. They didn't know what happened. Why we haven't heard from them? How come there hasn't been a mailbag or the train didn't come in? And so they sent up a, a small plane to see what happened to them. And by the time that plane saw that and reported back, and by the time they figured out what happened, that Hiroshima was, was devastated by a bomb by the United States, supposedly the um, Imperial Command were writing the Articles of, um, of Surrender complete unconditional surrender they were writing that and as they were writing that we dropped another bomb so the reason why the Japan didn't have a quick response is because they were slow to recognize that what happened in their own one of their cities because of the times and the slowness of understanding what happens you know and so we didn't need to drop this other bomb okay which was pretty sad but we did so and this was our final weapon Okay, it had a plutonium core. Don't remember that plutonium is one of the others, and so it has a. This has a different different way to do things. Okay, so I'll just show you that. Okay, um, and so the Fat Man was the name of this bomb, and I'm going to remove the shell. And so what it has is a beryllium polonium core, and the explosive actually pushes the plutonium into each other. It's an implosion device. It's one that we still use today. And the reason why they used uh, plutonium is that they ran out of uranium, but they knew that plutonium worked the same. So if we detonate that, you can see the implosion. It's not really a really great show. It's not really a great image there, but you get the idea. We'll come back to something like that. So it's an implosion device. Okay. Um, any case, um, it also created a tremendous amount of destruction. I think this is Hiroshima still, if I'm not, no, maybe not. I'm not really sure. But the point is, um, it didn't create as much destruction as Hiroshima only because um, it was dropped in an industrial area that had less people and two, that was more hilly. So um, the mountainous or hilly terrain actually absorbed some of the blast. It had a greater yield. The other one was 15 kilotons, this was 21 kilotons of TNT. Okay, 
um, and it certainly did kill plenty of people. It didn't have as much of a devastating effect as Hiroshima, but certainly, um, you know, you still had the radiation sickness, the tremendous amount of death and destruction. All right, that went with this, and uh, believe me, there were plenty of people who worked on the Manhattan projects who um, um, contemplated, uh, you know, their own work. And what did we do? We unleashed the devil, so to speak. People felt guilty the rest of their lives putting together this bomb, uh, which they were so enthused to build to be the first or to figure out the science, but to realize it was something we should not have used. Einstein was against the use of these weapons. Um, interesting enough, he was the one that brought the possibility of the weapon to the United States uh, idea when Germany could have been building it. All right. All right. So some devastation there. Now, it's, if that wasn't sad enough, well, we have bombs today that are 700 times more powerful than the atomic devices. These are fusion bombs. They are more powerful. And they have a, uh, I don't know why I keep going back here, but they are um, more powerful because they're using nuclear fusion which in itself creates a greater more a great amount of energy being released but how they design them it's very very important now it's important to realize that fusion bombs is basically hydrogen okay or some type of light nuclei being forced together well, what's the problem in fusion fusion requires tremendous amount of energy to push the nuclei together so it's interesting to note that our current h bombs or hydrogen bombs are just names of bombs using what fusion so fusion uses what light nuclei most of the time the light nuclei is hydrogen so h bomb is the word for fusion bombs we know they give off more energy but what's the problem of fusion we need a tremendous amount of energy to push them together so to start a fusion bomb you need a fission bomb so we take the same fission bomb that was in the um, fat boy bomb and that's really what gives the energy for the light nuclei to come together so let's take a look at um, this Tela Ulam uh, type of design okay we move the shell now this is on top of an ICBM and this is what's really crazy is that on the top of an ICBM that's pointed at us okay New York City and we have them pointed at Moscow or different places there is multiple warheads that's crazy. That means that not only we have we have multiple fusion bombs, right? So when you open one up, okay, each one itself, okay, is much much more stronger than the atomic bomb we drop. But we have multiple warheads, and of course, you detonate. We have this implosion device that gives the energy for the fusion to occur. So it's incredible and pretty scary to think of what kind of power. Can you think about a nuclear warhead delivering a bomb that's 700 times more powerful than one dropped in Hiroshima on New York City, and what would that look like? Okay, what would that look like for us being 80, 90 miles away? Well, we'd be hit with a uh, a wind that would t take take down our houses and the heat would burn us I mean it just we, we, there's no place to run there even though we wouldn't be hit directly with the bomb the effects of the blast the wind and the heat would be devastating to us not to mention the radiation fallout and you say well what about the radiation fallout well the radiation fallout of course is because what starts a fusion bomb okay the fission part of the bomb and not all of that's gonna fission alright so pretty scary stuff there alright uh, and of course we've talked about um, the uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant in 2011 that had a meltdown that was a fission okay and been through that okay so real fast uses of radioisotopes okay uh, I know carbon-14 uh, can be used as a tracer as well in living things okay just real fast uh, technician 99 if you have to take the regions you have to know some of these technician te 99 is used to determine location of brain tumors we talked about I-131 is used to diagnose thyroid disturbances. These are just things you unfortunately have to memorize for the regions. Okay, cancer cells are treated by cobalt-60. Okay, we also know that radiation isn't always bad. We can destroy bacteria, yeast, and molds. Okay, uh, and that's how we actually are uh, disinfecting uh, some things in our society with some type of form of radiation to kill microorganisms like the coronavirus. Okay. Um, and then, of course, half-lives, okay? Uh, also, we, we didn't talk about this, but uranium can, be can turn into lead 
by what we call a radioactive dis, uh, radioactive series. Many steps of it giving off, let's say, an, an alpha particle, and then it's thorium, and then it gives off an alpha particle, and that gives off a beta particle. Eventually, after all of those changes, and it takes billions of years, it'll become lead. So if we've got rocks on the Earth that both have lead and uranium, we can work out to say, well, um, that lead that's next to uranium was once uranium, and we can actually, using half-lives, figure out that decay series and age non-living materials. Okay, if we want to age living materials, it's carbon-14. Okay, so that's important to recognize. And here's some of the uses: is carbon-238, 236 is dating geological formations. Iodine-131 is for diagnosing treating thyroid disorders. And this is called a goiter. If you have a uh, hypothyroid, okay, if you're lacking iodine in your um, um, your nutrition, uh, then you can have this 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 very hypothyroid, okay, um, uh, hyperthyroid, sorry, bigger, okay, thyroid, um, and it's a, a sign of goiter of, of being malnourished in iodine. So people who don't eat iodine, who are not eating fish or on a coast, can uh, be deficient in that area and in goiters. We don't see these in our society because we put iodine in our food. Salt, which is almost everywhere. NaCl, we add iodine. So if you ever look at table salt, they'll say there's a little bit of iodine added as a supplement. And the reason why you have iodine added to your sodium chloride, your, your table salt, as a necessary nutrient is to prevent this in society. Okay, so it's important. Um, Carbon-14 or carbon-12, there's the Shroud of Turan. Okay, that's the actual, they think, those people who believe that that's the imprint of the face of Jesus that covered his body. Um, they dated it. It was about 2,000 years old. It doesn't support the fact that it definitely is Jesus' face, but it does support the fact that it was definitely uh, made during that time period based upon how much carbon-14 was left. Remember, it decays into nitrogen, right? So those are important things we talked about, cobalt-60. So what we have left, okay, are these questions. And I want you to click through these questions, and uh, that'll be your last assignment, okay? And so I hope you uh, enjoy the last little piece of learning that happened today. And please click through these questions, and that will be your assignment um, at this point and your last assignment. So hope that helped, and good luck.